welcome to those of you here in the audience uh, and to those of you uh, who are watching online. Welcome to the Fed uh, Hermes Federated Building. And my name is Richard Folland. I'm Carbon Trackers Policy and Government Affairs Advisor. And we've got a terrific event lined up for you this afternoon for the next 90 minutes on the energy transition and its far-reaching implications. And uh, I'm, I'm going to hand over in a moment uh, to our keynote speaker from Sustainable Energy for All, uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn Pierce Oroz. And Glenn is going to speak to us for five minutes or so. And we're then going to have a couple of short presentations. And then we're going to hand over to our moderator, Katerina from Carbon Tracker, who's uh, going to introduce a terrific panel we have. So without any further ado, welcome again. And Glenn, if you'd like to come to the stage, please. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Richard. Uh, as Richard said, uh, my name is Glenn Pierce Soros. I'm the Director for International Relations and Special Projects with Sustainable Energy for All. And it's been two extremely intense weeks. I'm sure most of you can empathize uh, with the type of activity that's gone on here in Glasgow. We do think that these have been extremely important weeks as well especially as we reflect on what has happened between the Madrid COP and this COP, and what we expect will be the roadmap from this COP to next year's COP27 in Egypt. And one of the reflections that I'd like to share with you has to do with what we were expecting and what we were surprised with over these past two weeks. A partner, a colleague, said at one point, and this was, you know, a year or two or three ago, uh, that if Nigeria starts to move on net zero, that will be an aha moment. Last week, Nigeria started to move on net zero. And so these are important political signals that we're starting to hear with much more recurring uh, frequency when we hear President Buhari talk about a pathway for Nigeria to net zero by 2060. When we hear Prime Minister uh, Modi talk about net zero in India by 2070. When we hear President Joko from Indonesia talk about net zero in Indonesia by 2060 or sooner, and he and his, his uh, government are always very keen on adding that or sooner if possible. So this is a really important moment where we start to see a lot of the politics aligning. There's clearly colleagues who are just across the street are, are clearly hard at work to make sure that this ends well as it began, and by ending well, it has to address the ambition gap, it has to address the financing gap, and there's a third credibility gap, which is extremely important that needs to be closed. The ambition gap is what I started off reflecting upon, what we've heard from you know, these three major economies uh, in the developing world, and of course there have been many other uh, commitments, many other signals that were captured, the number of countries that have signed on to no new coal, the number of countries who are, who are ready to go in that direction. The financing gap, of course, is, is one of the, the elephants that keeps following the COP train uh, from venue to venue uh, and needs to be addressed and, and is being addressed, so I understand. And the credibility gap. The credibility gap we have heard time and again over these past two weeks, the importance of the Global South saying, you discussed $100 billion per year, has not happened to date. Uh, this is not leadership. How can you expect us to trust in this type of commitment when it's not delivered? So those are very frank, very direct messages that have been coming through 
over the past two weeks. And I would submit that one of the ways of addressing this credibility gap is that it's time to get into the weeds. It's time to start focusing on the context of each different economy, recognizing the differences in the global south, recognizing that we need to adjust approaches in the global south. And there, there could be uh, uh, a, a really interesting way of, of starting to look at who are the low emitters and energy poor countries, who are the high emitters and fast developing countries, and then some countries that will be in between that have to deal with uh, uh, transition as well as development and some countries that, that can start focusing more on transition. Those four categories already help us to start thinking differently about what different types of developing countries will require if our energy transitions will be important uh, and if we want them to have uh, long-term implications. This is one way of starting that discussion. I'm extremely pleased uh, to be here today because I'm very interested in listening uh, to what our colleagues will share with us in terms of their research coming up. This is part of the getting into the weeds that we need to do. Uh, we will hear first from Mike Coffin, head of oil and gas at Carbon Tracker, who will share with us some of the research that's been going on um, to really test policies. Uh, and Mike, without further ado, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Sounds like that's good. So um, what I'd like to do today is briefly cover some research we put out at the start of the year. So our, no our sort of traditional focus at Carbon Tracker is looking at stranded asset risk and transition risks from an investment perspective. But actually, we wanted to see if we tr could translate some of that work um, and understand a bit more of the impact on nation states and countries, um, primarily from a policy perspective. Now. Yep, so we extended our analysis, our least cost modeling, through to understanding the impact on nation states. In our report, beyond petrostates, the burning need to cut oil uh, dependence, sorry, in the energy transition. And I think it's critical here, it's not just the petrostates that need to, um, to transition, but it's in the interest of the entire global community for these petrostates to transition to. And what I'd like to do now is um, briefly summarize uh, some of that research over the next 10 minutes or so. And I think the, the first thing I would say here is it's not, this isn't around the domestic energy provision. What we're not doing here is saying that uh, countries in the global south should not be using the resources they have necessarily, but what this really is about recognizing the transition risks that many of these petrostates face um, as ultimately as the uh, energy transition, the inevitable energy transition gathers pace that ultimately the market for these countries' exports will diminish, and that creates a significant fiscal sustainability uh, challenge for countries around the world. So these are the points I'd like to leave us with today. The petrostates must act now to reframe their economies. You know, as we've heard many times over the past couple of weeks, but we cannot say it enough, reaching net zero requires fossil fuel consumption to fall, and fossil fuel consumption to fall rapidly, not just by mid-century, but over the next decade, uh, to ensure that we have the interim steps, um, interim reductions on that pathway towards net zero. This reduction in uh, oil and gas demand will significantly impact producers' fiscal, um, fiscal um, budget, and ultimately their revenue, and ultimately the fiscal sustainability of their national budgets. And we'll, I'll present some of the data behind this and, and really quantify the scale of, of uh, the impact that this will have. I say these, in response, the petrostates must reduce their dependence on oil and gas now, take action now to reframe their economy in an, as part of an orderly transition. And it's critical also that other countries do not become petrostates. So we, we identify a group of what we term the emerging petrostates. They're looking to double down um, uh, and, re, and sort of build their economies around an industry that, that's on the way out. And we see this as a huge problem for these states. Next. And just to reiterate that, it's in the interest of all nations uh, to support these economies to diversify. Okay, just, let me just click on there. So reaching net zero means reduced oil and gas production. The IEA has been very clear earlier this year. Net zero by 2050 scenario means no new oil and gas projects. And we must, 
we can just allow the existing production to wind down uh, in orderly fashion over the coming decades. We cannot sanction new, new projects. And I think sometimes the IEA has been misquoted over the past week. It doesn't mean no production at all. We cannot just turn off the taps. But what we need is an orderly wind down. And the production or oil demand under that net zero scenario um, can be met from future production from already existing assets. And that's shown on the, in the chart on the right, which is for oil demand, um, oil demand and supply for the next, uh, next two decades. So what you have in the, the dark gray at the bottom is the, uh, the future supply from already sanctioned assets, and then various demand pathways. And, and that lowest demand pathway in green, the net, um, net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, you see that, that that demand is actually less than future supply uh, for any sanctioned assets. This is for oil, for gas, the situation is slightly different, but broadly it's the same. And you can see there, we've also plotted two other, two other charts uh, for demand lines. In, in blue, you have the sustainable development scenario, 1.65 degree, and then actually you have the stated policy scenario, a 2.7 degree outcome, which is in the orange at the top. And you'll see that is, that is what we believe is business as usual, that companies and nation states are planning on, yet that's very different uh, from a pathway that takes us to net zero. So it's clear that other, other power supply pathways also need a very rapid decline in, in oil particularly, but also gas as well. And anyone who is planning, uh, whether that be at a company or a nation state, who is planning on business as usual, so that orange pathway, risks creating significant stranded assets and destroying value, both via their national oil company investments, but also through a lack of taxation revenue on listed company activities. So effectively, companies that are um, planning on business as usual are betting on climate failure and nation states too. So what we identify is that governments face a $13 trillion revenue shortfall over the next two decades versus business as usual expectations. We see that falling demand for oil and gas, lower volumes, uh, lower volumes clearly, but also lower pricing as a result of this. Ultimately, the supply demand imbalance will create lower pricing, and actually, that's a stronger effect. Together, those two aspects combine um, to give significantly go lower government revenues. And on the chart on the right, what we see on the left hand side, we've got industry expectations of around $25 trillion uh, over the next two decades. Yet under a low carbon scenario, and of course low carbon effectively equates to low demand for fossil fuels scenario, we see $13 trillion of lower revenue. However, we should not interpret this chart as saying the energy transition is bad, far from it. What we, should, what we interpret this chart by saying is companies must prepare for that loss of revenue. And if they continue to sanction assets based or predicated on the expectations of continued high demand, they stand to lose even more money, uh, if they're planning on that left-hand side of the graph, plan to lose even more money through the creation of assets that become stranded or could become stranded and destroy even further value. So we see sort of around a 50% shortfall. So sort of that is a very, very high level uh, piece on the analysis there. But in terms of some of the outcomes here, and it's really the conclusions from this report, I think the headline there, over 400 million people live in countries where over 20% of total government revenue is at risk over the next two decades. That's not 20% of oil revenue, that's 20% that's of total government revenue. This is a huge fiscal sustainability challenge for these countries. And what we do is we highlight 40 petrostates, so we identify the top 40 countries most dependent on oil, and we look at, um, on the x-axis on that cross plot, the, their current fiscal dependence on oil and gas revenues. Um, so the least dependent countries on the left to the most dependent countries on the right. And then what we look at on the y-axis is the potential oil and gas revenue shortfall um, under a low carbon scenario. So we here take the sustainable development scenario. So uh, the greater shortfall is at the top and the, the least shortfall is at the bottom. Of course, those two things combine, so current dependence and your future shortfall combine, and we combine those together to give an indication of vulnerability. And that's what the curved lines and the shading indicates. So in that tier five, in the top right, the most vulnerable countries, we see over 40% of total government revenues at risk over the next two decades. This is a huge implication for fiscal sustainability. In that middle tier, tier four, between 20 and 40% at risk, um, we, see some, we see countries such as Algeria and Nigeria and also Saudi Arabia. And combined in tiers four and five, we see over 400 million people living in these countries. This is a huge issue. As I reiterate, this is not around um, domestic energy supply or domestic energy consumption. This is around 
de decline in an export market for these current these petrostates and the loss of that revenue, of, which is a key uh, driver of um, a key contribution to uh, GDP in these in these states. As I say, I highlight Angola, Nigeria, Algeria, and also Saudi Arabia uh, and other countries too. And of course, we should recognise that many of these countries have been identified by the UN as having low uh, human development indices, and of course, many of these are part of the global south. But we should also uh, reflect here that it's particularly important to, to recognise, sorry, that the global south is particularly impacted by the physical effects of climate change. So these countries are particularly impacted, but it's also particularly in their interests as well uh, to accelerate the transition and reduce their dependence on oil and gas. But of course, the petrostate's ability to respond varies significantly. Some of these countries have huge sovereign wealth funds that can be used to support the transition. So we identify, for example, Norway as, as a petrostate still. They still fit within that group. But we see them both lower vulnerability, but much greater means to adapt to the challenge through that sovereign wealth fund. So sorry, the chart on the right is their vulnerability uh, versus their per capita sovereign wealth uh, net of government debt. Other countries too, if you look on the right of that chart, the most vulnerable countries have the least ability to respond. We've seen government debt for these countries rising significantly over the past decade. We also see a very broad range of credit ratings as well, some, some from investment grade, but also very speculative ratings. So the access to credit um, really impacts these countries' ability to respond. But I should end here on a positive note. Of course, the energy transition creates a huge opportunity for these countries to reframe their economies as well. I think that is a theme that I'm sure will be picked up through the following uh, talk and, of course, through um, the, the panel discussion as we move on. Now, we're not policy experts. We like to do the research and focus on the research and the analysis and the numbers. However, we wanted to identify a number of themes for international policymakers, of course, relevant here at COP, both from a domestic uh, and from an international perspective. We need to recognize this need to act now. We cannot wait until uh, peak fossil fuels or until we're past, sorry, peak demand for oil and gas. We must take action now to avoid continuing to sanction assets predicated on 30 years of demand for fossil fuels. Long-lived assets, a lot of capital being spent now. We must take, must recognize the issue now and not double down and lock ourselves in to continue oil and gas. We need to reassess the relationship of national oil companies with central government. What is their role in a, in a post-fossil fuel world? Create incentives and, of course, understand, reform the taxation system. And it's interesting to see in the past couple of years, we have seen the steps of that starting in some Middle Eastern countries and we absolutely need that to continue. And again, I reiterate, plan now for an orderly transition to, to minimize the revenue loss over the coming decades. So from a domestic perspective, some very high level comments there, but from an international perspective, I can only reiterate, it is in all nations' interests for the petrostates to move away from a dependence on oil and gas. A whole manner of geopolitical um, concerns and, and problems that may arise, and we don't have time, unfortunately, to go in, into those in any detail now. But I'd like to touch on, just very briefly, the ways they can support. So technical assistance around taxation and governance, technological expertise. Obviously, there's direct foreign investment we've just heard in the, in the opening speech uh, about that level and how that must increase. But also learnings from transition company, uh, countries. Sorry. So an uh, interesting talk earlier in the week uh, hosted by Denmark around d the Danish experience of transitioning, transitioning the companies, transitioning the communities and the skills and the jobs and the, ultimately allowing that transition to be just. And then finally, assistance uh, from supranational programs. So I appreciate I've gone slightly over time there, but I'll just sort of leave you again with those key points that I started with as a sort of high level summary of that, that piece of work we did earlier in the year, the Beyond Petrostates report. Great. So I'll now hand over to Kingsmill Bond, our energy strategist, who's on the line. Um. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so uh, I, I'm, my principal role here is to introduce um, the brilliant uh, Matthew Ives, but um, I, I want to make a couple of points by way of introduction for him. Um, this energy transition, by definition, means four things. It means the continued rapid growth of new energy technologies. It means uh, an emerging market energy leapfrog. Uh, it means the decline and fall of the current incumbent fossil fuel system. And it means a reshaping, as Mike has said, of global geopolitics. That much is clear. The only issue is timing. Is it fast or is it slow? 
Is it this decade or is it 30 years from now? Um, and this is where I want now to hand over to Dr. Matthew Ives, who will present a, a groundbreaking, a brilliant new analysis um, by Oxford University, um, which challenges incumbent thinking on the slow nature of this shift and sets out the argument that change will be fast, it will be soon, and it will be cheaper than business as usual. Thank you very much. I hand over now to uh, Dr. I. Thank you, Kingsmill. Very nice words uh, from a great bloke and a great advocate for our research. So thank you for this opportunity to, to talk on that research. Um, so Kingsmill asked for a shocking um, name for my slide, Why Paris is Still Within Reach. And I'm going to try and convince you that that is the case, and I'm going to do it with science. But to do it with science, I'm going to need graphs, and I'm apologising uh, to start with. Uh, for all these graphs that I'm going to give you here, but hopefully um, it's going to be something that's going to be able to convince you because graphs are convincing that it's science. I'm going to go through what decision makers are being told right now, what's wrong with this in our perspective, do we have a different one, and how much we think that means the transition might cost. Uh, so this is what you're probably familiar with, hopefully you are, the, the picture that we're given uh, to decision makers about the future of emissions. You've got the black line that's showing emissions rising over the last 20 odd years from 20 to 40 gigatons a year. If we stay on that trend, we go up to the disastrous levels of four or five degrees, you know, hell on earth. Uh, but if we turn that ship around, we get down to those lower levels. That blue line is the 1.5 degrees scenarios. Um, that are considered safe. We don't have a problem with this. This is the uncertainty that we're facing uh, in terms of all the socioeconomic uh, uncertainty in the system. The problem we have is the way we're characterising in the integrated assessment models community in the IPCC how difficult it is to get to two degrees. In the modelling that they do, it suggests that we have to reduce our economic growth. Reducing economic growth re means reducing emissions one easy way to do it, not so easy because you've got to increase the carbon price to do it. We may need to reduce our uh, energy, uh, that also reduces our emissions. And if we pull on those levers as hard as we can, we still have to do this Herculean task of carbon capture and storage of around 13 gigatons. That's actually an ambitious number. And to give you an idea of how big that is, there's a one megaton site out in Canada, one megaton a year. Uh, to get to 13 gigatons by 2100, you're going to have to build one of those every two to three days for the next 80 years. And that's a huge engineering undertaking, and it sounds almost hard to believe. And because you're, this is a big piece of kit that you add on to your uh, power system, it's going to make your energy more expensive. So that's not an easy sell, and I'm not surprised the decision makers are balking at that. Um, what's wrong with that? Oh, well, there's one key piece that's wrong with that, is that the way that they're representing um, the, the developments that are happening in renewable energies in particular, and, and certain technologies around it, like storage. This is the actual solar PV cost going down through time. This is on a logarithmic scale. so. That IEA projection, the International Energy Agency projection in 2001, the yellow one, uh, that in 2020 their projection was about 800, it, it was actually 80. So they're out by an order of magnitude. They're out by 10 there. Um, and you can see that all these lines through the various world energy outlooks are all on the right hand side of that actual. If this was a random error, there'd be a few lines on the left hand side, but it's not. There's a systematic bias in what they're representing here. And technological progress is a difficult thing to model, and one reason why is because there's a positive feedback dynamic happening. When you deploy more of certain technologies, their costs come down. When their costs come down, people demand more. When they demand more, you deploy more, the costs come down. And when you get a positive feedback like that, you get exponential growth. That's why we've got this on a logarithmic scale, and that's why it looks like a straight line. Another problem with these models is they're very big. They're cumbersome things. They take a month to run. There's no single person that knows how these models work. And because they're so big and cumbersome, it takes them a long time to update them. But the prices are outstripping what they do. 
These are the prices in China compared to what they've got in their report. This is the latest one that's AR5. Not only were they wrong in 2020 in most cases, the actual price is below what they had in 2050. So you can imagine these models have far less solar in them than they should have. Um, so is there a different perspective? I'm going to do this for shock value and say, here's my different perspective. If technological trends continue for another decade, we'll be on track to meet the Paris goal. You probably haven't heard that yet. And you definitely haven't heard this, that meeting the Paris goal could cost less than business as usual. Actually, Kingsmill did the spoiler. But I'll add, even without accommodating climate damages, um, and I'm going to prove that with science. Uh, so on the left-hand side, and science means graphs, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> on the left-hand side, you've got uh, coal, oil and gas through time over the last century. This is inflation adjusted, but you can see the prices aren't really changing much through time. And then literally out of the heavens is coming solar. Um, and it's all bunching around the, the, the $100 per megawatt hour mark. Um, positive feedback dynamics and system thinking are problematic. They're disruptive. And as you can see, this is a disruptive technology. Add to that, you've got wind in the blue, uh, P2X, which is hydrogen electrolyzers, and batteries in there as well. And note on the right, the dynamic with production. This is the deployment of these technologies increasing exponentially through time. Is there a relationship? Um, well, I can tell you that technologies change at different rates at different, for different technologies. You've got some technologies there, like new cars and housing, you see haven't changed much. Household furnishings haven't changed much through time. Um, parents here are probably familiar with what's happening on the up side, that hospitals, college tu tuition fees, nurseries are going up in price fairly regularly. And down the bottom, you've got things like television, software, computing that's been coming down. Note two things. One, that different technologies uh, change their costs at different rates and that those rates are quite consistent. So once a technology becomes established, we can actually have a fair idea where it's going to go. Uh, so there's empirical laws, perhaps. Well, you've probably heard of this one, Moore's Law, that uh, processing speed could double every two years, with cost implications, of course. Uh, well, there's an older law than that, known as Wright's Law, which was developed by Paul Theodore Wright in the World War II, he was developing uh, aeroplanes for the war effort, and he noticed that whenever they doubled their cumulative production, costs went down at a regular rate. And the cumulative production in that case was a proxy for experience. They were learning by doing, they were learning from what they were doing. So the more they produced, the more they learned, the more the cost came down. And that's why these are called experience curves. And you can see here, those two laws work rather well for a range of different technologies, for transistors, photovoltaics, hard disk drives, ethanol. The difference with the two is that with Wright's Law, we've got some policy implications. We can actually drive those costs down by more deployment. Um, what we did at Oxford, many people have applied Wright's and Moore's Law, is put around some scientific sophistication to what we are doing in terms of projecting those costs forward. We're adding reliable error bars to what you can do when you project that forward at a certain rate of deployment. And this is a piece that was written in 2016, and you can see from then with the, what the prices did, they got it pretty much right. Actually, the cost came down faster than the median rate, but well within the bounds of the error that they gave to those predictions. So what are the implications of this, and how does that differ to what you're getting from the, the International Energy Agency? Well, let's just pick on the 2019 International Energy Agency's Sustainable Development Scenario. You take that line and you add that for all the different technologies in their scenario, and you get this view of the world in terms of the energy system. The darker colours are fossil fuels, and you can see them declining a little bit through time. And then electricity, which is mostly from renewables, but partly from carbon capture and storage, uh, brings your emissions down by about 30% by 2040. So reasonable progress, but not really getting us where we need to go. 
Uh, and there's a bit of a trick because there's carbon capture and storage, so this is actually going to cost us a bit more to do. Um, here's an alternative picture using our um, scientifically defensible, empirically grounded cost forecasts, and you get a very different and rapid transition. This is an exponential change in the system, uh, so disruptive change to the system. Now, by 2040, you've got the fossil fuel industry less than 20 per cent of where it was, and emissions are down to 80 per cent of what they were. Uh, so what are the implications in terms of the costs? Well, of course, we're modelers. We built a model to find that out. And we applied this te technique to a bunch of different technologies that are useful to understand this problem. Firstly, oil, the fossil fuel industry. Their costs, as I said, haven't changed much inflation adjusted through time over the last century uh, and you can see when we project them forward that's what happens they don't change that much uh, alternatively when you take some technologies like solar wind batteries and electrolyzers that are important for the transition to clean energy you can see each of them coming down in costs as you push them out the production out uh, further into the future and the faster you do it the faster those costs come down uh, we built an energy model that had about 90% of the world's final energy. I won't bore you with that graphic. I'll just put it in simple terms. One no transition scenario has just the usual dispatchable baseload energy. We replace that with renewables plus battery in our model. Liquid fuels, we replace that with renewables plus hydrogen, like green ammonia, fuels that you can transport around the world. You can use for seasonal, um, <coughs> seasonal seasonality. Uh, and hard to abate sectors like steel and shipping. Uh, and with those three technologies, you can pretty much replace the entire fossil fuel system. So renewables plus batteries plus hydrogen, and you've got a completely clean energy system. And what does it mean in terms of costs? Well, the no transition is the fossil fuel world. The, the brown one, you can see it through time growing at the 2% that we allow it to grow. And the fossil fuel mix not changing through time. And in contrast, the blue one is our fast transition. Same economic growth, same energy demand, uh, but it's met by through the efficiency that you get from electrifying transport and also the cost reductions. And you can see the, the differences between the two that add up over the next 50 years to about $26 trillion in saving for the same energy system. Well, completely different because it's clean. Uh, so what are our conclusions? Well, contrast to the picture that you just heard from the IPCC, that's all going to be slow and expensive, with this alternative, that the fast transition doesn't have to cost us in terms of economic growth. Um, we didn't require that in our modelling. We didn't require any reduction in energy use. Actually, that's a very good idea. It's going to save us a lot of money. It's, it's, it's a cost-effective thing that you would have done in any of the scenarios. Um, so we're not saying not to do it, we're just saying we didn't require to get these results. We didn't require any car carbon capture and storage. You may require it because we don't get the, us to net zero here because we're only doing the energy system, so you've got agriculture, you've got deforestation and so forth to take care of. Um, but because we didn't use that, things are much cheaper. In fact, in our estimates, the price of electricity is going to be as low as a third of what it is today. Now, to me, that solves about half of the sustainable development goals. Um, so conclusions, what we need is to change the mood music that's being played to decision makers. That continued strong investment in these key renewables, solar, wind, electrolyzers for hydrogen and batteries for storage, will put us on track to meet the Paris goals, will cost trillions less than business as usual. We should be doing it anyway. And actually, as I said, it's a disruptive feedback. It is happening anyway. Um, it need not reduce our economic prosperity um, because we didn't require it to and it worked just fine and it could make electricity much cheaper for everyone, which actually means every time in history that's happened, we've had economic growth. So green prosperity is likely in our future, given this world. We, um, we had the good fortune of having this sent to fairly high level at the Biden administration and in the UK government. They actually asked us for our data. And we believe the Glasgow Breakthrough Agenda is based on this work. So there is policy implications for this that are quite obvious and they're written quite large in the, the Glasgow Breakthrough Agenda. Uh, one last point. 
Um, I know we're going to talk about the global si south and, and whether everyone has enough uh, renewable potential. Well, they do. The estimates are quite large, but we have about three to 100 times as much renewable energy as we need to power virtually every country and for them to power themselves. So a completely different geopolitical dynamic. And it's not the countries that have got the cheapest solar that are investing most in solar. These are the countries that have. And they've got the lowest cost now because they're learning by doing. And look how much potential there is in the global south and the rest of the world. Um, wind is complementary. It's in the poles, so you're going to have plenty of wind where there's not enough sun. Um, so I would question anyone that's trying to tell you that they, they need interim so solutions. You also need to look at the renewable options available. There's microgrids based on renewables in very remote locations, and they're working just fine. So at least consider that option. You don't want to be convincing someone to make typewriters when the internet is here. And you want to be leaving them with a gift, not a burden. These technologies have low operating and maintenance. Thank you. Thank you to, to, to our brilliant speaker, so that certainly gave us a lot of food for thought. So um, we're now moving on to um, our panel discussion. Um, and if I could um, invite Glenn and Nicholas to, to come up. We have a brilliant panel. So first of all, um, we have Glenn Pierce Oros, who is Senior Director of International Relations and Special Projects at Sustainable Energy for All. Then we have Nicholas Hulstrom, who is Director at the What Next Forum. We have Catherine Dixon, who is the Chief Counselor for the Energy Transition at the IEA. Spencer Dale, who is the Chief, Econ Chief Economist at BP and Nafi Chinri, who is the uh, West Africa Regional Manager at NRGI. So if we go back to the two presentations that we've seen and take those, take those into a broader context, we can clearly identify one or two overarching topics. Um, and one of those is the international community. What can the international community and supranational institutions do? but also on a second level, what does it mean for individual countries and what can individual countries do? So what I'd like to do is um, kick off um, for with a question for you, Glenn. Um, what do you think makes, given that we have just seen how ambitious an energy transition could be, what actually makes for an ambitious energy transition in a particular country? What sort of priorities should countries set? Uh, so th thanks very much, and, and, and I, I want to congratulate the, uh, the two presenters uh, who, who did put a lot of issues uh, on the table, um, which, which, which will challenge us, I think, in, in the way we think about uh, energy transition. Going back to the question of, of what makes for ambition in specific countries and what priorities uh, should be undertaken, I think a, a, a big step in this is certainly opening up the political space to be able to move in this particular direction. And we've heard this time and again from different countries over these past two weeks. Uh, so that's extremely important. But at the end of the day, the COPs, COP26, is a political process. Uh, this is about aligning the politics. That's the first link in the chain. Uh, we desperately need to get to the other links in the chain, uh, which is actually putting this into practice. And so when, when we think about uh, the, the energy transition plan that was announced um, by Nigeria uh, and focused on its roadmap to 2060 net zero, uh, and it's costing out of the details. This is going into the weeds 
uh, of their energy transition um, and identifying a, an approximate cost of $410 billion. Um, uh, sorry, Matt, that's 410 above business as usual, so they, they, they didn't have uh, um, the benefit of, of your thinking yet, um, but the costing was above business as usual, $410 billion. The next link in the chain is, is really trying to figure out how does this get financed? Different parts of the energy sector are going to be affected. Um, many things have to happen at the, at the same time uh, to get this moving. And how can we do this quickly enough so that we don't backslide in terms of credibility? Uh, if, if we're not able to provide that support and for Nigeria to get to uh, its pathway of, of energy transition, then that, that is as serious a signal uh, as, 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 as not being able to generate the 100 billion per year. Um, because it's, it's having a developing country say, we're taking this seriously, this is our plan, we need support. If there's no support to be had, then we run into um, uh, serious problems. Uh, so I, I think a lot of this is, you know, getting down to specifics, recognizing different economies will have different needs, will need, have different priorities, um, but listening and engaging with those economies to be able to identify what those priorities are. Thanks, thanks. Perhaps I can pass that on to Catherine, and actually taking us through to your view on, on the challenges that countries may face and where are the big obstacles or what do they need to do to get to link in that next link in the chain? Yeah, thank you. And I think, again, echoing um, some great presentations, and I agree entirely with, with Glenn's point. I mean, whatever lens you, you use to look at the future of energy, what, what happens in emerging and developing economies um, over the next period is going to be critical because this is where the majority of energy investment is really needed. But you know, the reality is that annual energy investment in many of these economies, excluding China, um, has been falling, um, actually by about one fifth between 2016 and 2020. Um, a big part of this, of course, is lower spending on um, oil and gas supply in, in many of the hydrocarbon rich countries, but, but investments actually fallen across all regions. And I think that really reflects the persistent challenge that we've got in mobilizing finance towards what is a more capital intensive um, set of assets in, you know, in power and energy efficiency and in, in the new assets that we need in transport. And that's even before you know, we factor in COVID-19. But we've, we've got to change this because you know, there are, there's much more emission saving opportunities to be had by investing in the emerging and developing economies compared to the mature markets, partly because of their, their energy mix, they're often got higher shares of coal, but also because it's, it's better to build clean than, than retrofit. And these are the, the fastest growing economies in the world. Um, but it's not gonna be an easy issue to solve. Um, we've got a bit more development finance on the table, that, that's good um, and should be welcomed. But in the IEA scenarios uh, that we look at, um, we think about 70% of clean energy investments um, are going to be, need to be privately financed. Uh, so we're going to, go, going to need uh, companies like Spencer's here to um, step up and stump up the cash for this. But there's just a huge range of barriers um, for getting that cash where it needs to go. You know, we talked about it being a more capital intensive um, energy system. So a lot of it's going to come from debt financing. Um, you know, and these are economies where capital has been traditionally constrained and, and the cost of capital is higher. Um, but as Glenn says as well, you know, a lot of the barriers are, are highly context uh, specific. But in general, I think policy predictability, you know, clear and ambitious energy strategies and good governance um, will go a long way. Um, and that's, I think, where the focus should be. Um, a lot of countries have now set targets for emissions reductions and energy access, but they're not always backed up by those clear policies and, and, and measures. Um, that are going to make them happen, happen and going to be necessary to attract the kind of levels of private finance that we're going to need. Thanks, Catherine. Um, it would be very interesting, Nafi, if you could share with us a local perspective from um, what are your experience, what you have seen in Ghana with these, um, the challenges, but perhaps also some of the, uh, the positives on the energy transitions and and also the, the major considerations that your, your stakeholders are facing and what you think people need to look at. Thanks very much, uh, 
Very nice. I think it will be useful to, if I put this in, into perspective with a bit of background. So crude oil production in Ghana started in 2010. In the last 10 years, Ghana has produced a little over 450 million barrels of oil, translating to about 6.5 billion US dollars in revenue to the state, which represents about 7% of government revenue on average. Um, government uses this revenue to support key sectors of the economy, education, health, agriculture, and roads. The impact of climate change and the energy transition is being okay. We have started seeing a redirection of investment projects. Projects are being stalled, and we are, um, and we are projecting a decline in production in the medium term. <laughs> government finances will be affected. Borrowing may continue to increase, and fiscal challenges will remain imminent. And so what we are beginning to experience is real tension among stakeholders and what is the best approach for dealing with the transition from fossil fuel to cleaner energy in a manner that does not harm the economy and the environment. Obviously, halting production would create revenue gap, denying government of an assured revenue source to finance specific sectors of the economy. We know that the transition is a to uh, countries like Ghana and also could be uh, beneficial, but actions by the government could make it worse. So for example, in July this year, the National Oil Company and the Ministry of Energy made a proposal to the country's parliament to borrow up to 1.6 billion US dollars to buy back sticks in two oil fields owned by Eka Energy and AGM as a way of dealing with the impact of energy transition. This was strongly kicked against by civil society organizations in Ghana based on the values placed on the assets and riskiness of the investment. Energy transition requires appropriate which Ghana may be running late on, but cannot be for poor decisions that threatens the country's economic and fiscal outlook. We are likely to see such risky decisions by governments play out across the continent and so I think that it is critically urgent to consider three things. And I think some of these resonate with what previous speakers have said, that uh, political countries, governments, need to have a plan to develop, a, a plan to manage the drop in oil demand, and a plan that speaks to the specific country context, realities and needs. For example, Ghana needs to have a comprehensive outlook on what energy transition means, the risk and opportunities. Policies on renewable energy and petroleum are on different trajectories, and this lack of linkage creates appetite towards energy transition. We need to resolve the policy gap in linking upstream oil and gas development with energy transition. Two, I think the government needs to have a plan on how to spend climate financing. This requires a strong and rigorous governance system to guide the implementation of programs. Otherwise, it will be money going down the drain. Three, I think open and frank engagement with all stakeholders to ensure consensus. Again, other speakers have said about it, to ensure consensus on a viable path to the transition that is owned by all would be very useful. Useful a shared understanding among institutions on the risk and opportunities that come with um, and the transition would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Nafi. Um, let's say we are seeing quite some common threads coming out of this. There's clearly. Um, the need for ambitious policy, there is the need for credible and clear um, and transparent plans. Um, and I think there is another element that we should probably be talking about, um, and I would call, like to call on Nicholas on that, um, the aspect of just transition. Um, how does that fit into the picture? Well, of course, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential. Um, and, and I think just to say, um, I think what Matthew showed is, is absolutely fundamental to see this picture of what's actually possible and it's not the sort of extrapolation of the current trends. It's, it's very disruptive. There's an incredible potential um, and we welcome that. It builds towards a new, very rapid sort of rollout of the, the, re the renewable energy sort of revolution which will be another battlefront also in terms of what system do we choose and what kind of um, um, you know, just transition elements will also happen there uh, because we gotta have to choose between you know, very centralized systems, the same kinds of corporate uh, concentration in the new system versus more distributed 
uh, perhaps more economically diversified and, and, and more uh, uh, you know, locally based energy uh, production on renewables. And, and there's a whole lot of, of course, uh, issues around you know, extraction, uh, around land and so on that will be very much at core of this new uh, frontier in a way which of course needs to be handled from the very outset as one dimension of just transition we don't really talk too much about. Then of course just transition in the case of the, the, the actual rollout and quick act, phase down of the fossil fuel industry will have enormous consequences for many, many people. Uh, of course the unions have been pioneering the just transition in terms to, to fossil fuel workers and have a lot of good thoughts and ideas around how that should be, which we need to take to our hearts. But it's also going beyond that. There's other sectors. Industrial agriculture will have to change fundamentally. There's workers in those sectors. There's workers in transportation, etc. But I also think that is, is we need to also factor in other pieces when it comes to the just transition, which of course would speak to, you know, we talk about economic growth. We talk about extrapolation of an economic kind of uh, mainstream notion of economic development that that might not be that feasible. Uh, so what is, what is it that we need to do in terms of actually talking about energy use, justice when it comes to, or just transition when it comes to energy use levels? You know, a Swede is consuming 130 times more electricity than a Tanzanian. Tanzanian. Are we talking about Tanzania catching up to the Swedish levels, or are we actually finding a level of responsible well-being which speaks to things like sufficiency, even post-growth for advanced societies? And that's part of the just transition conversation as well, that we need to kind of factor in. And ultimately, we're talking about development and well-being. What is it that we're really trying to do here, where energy can be an incredible lever for radical change of our economics and our development models, but it can also be a tool to perpetuate the systems we see at play, even here. Um, and it's not a given outcome, it, although the economics are very promising, as Matthew pointed out. We have the biggest delegation in this negotiation is the fossil fuel industry. There's hurdles to overcome that will work against these sound trajectories, including, in my mind, one of the most problematic things we're facing here at COP, which is the net zero framing, which has been increasingly contested, as we've seen, because obviously this allows an incredible amount of loopholes and a justification for the fossil fuel industries to continue extracting fossil fuels from the ground and burning through you know, the idea of future capture and, and offsets and so on and so forth. If we allow that to happen, the po potential for this just transition and energy transformation that Matthew so rightly pointed out will not happen. At least it won't happen in time. And we will get into very serious new issues of new injustices. So there's a whole set of, of, of injustices that I think we need to look at when it comes to the just transition. Thank you, and clearly we've seen the risks that are being exposed. We've seen that in Mike's report, um, as he's just uh, presented. So it, the risk is absolutely massive if they get that just transition wrong. There, yeah. there, there's no doubt about that. And you have uh, kind of provided us the link to get that corporate perspective in. Um, so Spencer, do get ready. I would like to pass this over to you. Um, we've, now, we've heard a lot about the exponential learning curves, about the fast cost down rates, um, yet we've also heard um, a lot of industry isn't actually investing or it's small amount, amount of capex budgets. Um, what in your view can companies do to progress alignment with the Paris Agreement and get onto the track of getting on that right pathway? Uh, uh, thank you, and thank you very much to the other speakers. I thought it was um, really fascinating um, presentations. So I think when we're thinking about the role of large organizations like oil and gas companies like BP, I think I start from some of the points that, that, that have already been made in terms of the nuances. So the points that Glenn and Nafi made that we need to think about when, we, when our role in terms of the developing world, we need to start with thinking hard about the priorities of the countries we're working in and thinking about making sure we meet their specific needs. And I do think there's quite a danger about the global north imposing their, their, their blueprint of how they're doing or what they're doing in, in their countries and imposing that on, on, the, on the global south. And so I think we need to recognize 
that these countries are starting in a very different place with many different challenges, with very different um, needs. As Nicolas said, I mean, these countries need to increase their energy consumption very considerably, while, while, while those of us in the, in the developed economies need to start reducing our energy very um, substantially. And as Catherine said, we need to find ways of channeling huge amounts of, of capital, but particularly private capital, from the developed world into the uh, developing world, and we need to find ways of doing that. And I think what's, what's the special role of, a, of companies like, like BP? I mean, as we reduce our carbon footprint, and as we reduce the amount of oil and gas we produce, and increasingly try to build low carbon businesses, we will do some of that in well-developed um, markets uh, uh, in, in, in the West, and we are actively building uh, wind and solar businesses in Europe and the UK. But I think also what, what is special about um, uh, companies like BP is they've been dealing in energy in all parts of the globe for, for many, many uh, years. And so we have relationships and, and knowledge about how to, to operate there. And so, for example, uh, BP in the form of BP Light, Light Source BP has been operating the, the Green Growth Fund in India, which is a, a $700 million fund uh, actively investing in the low carbon transition in India, and we've been co-managing that. And some of that is our own financing, but a lot of that is co-managing other people's money, helping to find projects and doing that. So I think we can play a role using our experience and reputation and contacts in, in, across the globe in helping, trying to generate this funding from the, uh, from the West uh, to, to the developing economies in a way which may, meets the, their needs and priorities. Thanks. Thanks, Spencer. Um, perhaps if we could bring Catherine back in, I'd be very interested to hear, we've heard a lot about the Global South needs support, um, the Global North needs to help. There are big challenges on the policy front, but they're obviously very, very big financing challenges. Um, what is your view? What can supranational institutions do? What can the international community to, to bring it forward? Great. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I think there's a lot that we can do. And I think we, should, you know, we start with, um, I think, the idea that, that international organizations like the IEA can be places where you know, best practice and learning, learning is shared, and we can um, play a a useful role, I think, in supporting countries to implement the kinds of policies and, and approaches that they need to attract um, investment. And you know, there's a range of, of barriers: um, getting price signals right, getting the contractual or licensing or land acquisition issues right. Um, you know, in many cases, you know, countries will need to improve the financial performance of, of the SOEs that are potentially investing in grid systems, or they need to empower new businesses. So, I think there's a range of that kind of. Um, you know, policy um, and implementation advice that you know, international organizations are well placed to support with. Um, clearly, there's an enhanced role for international and development finance institutions that's, that's going to be critical. Um, if we're going to catalyze the investment as well, it needs to be better joined up with policy. But I think the one that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about is, is the role of international organizations in coordinating policy. Um, and I'd say that we're, you know, I think the, the Glasgow breakthroughs are a great start, but I would say we were very, very far away from having landed the institutional setup and the processes that we need to coordinate energy policy. You know, what we're looking at um, with the global energy transition is a series of, of sectoral transitions. Um, and in order to make those happen at the, the pace required, we're going to need much stronger collaboration and coordination on energy. And when I think about this, I often reflect on, on the changes that we saw in the 20th century, when we saw many of the major powers negotiating their collective security through the creation of, of radically new institutions and processes. Not all of them perfect, but if, if you think about the kind of institutional growth of the 20th century to deal with security, I think we need the same kind of institutional development to deal with this very different kind of threat in the 21st century and we'll need the same kind of creative political leadership to reimagine the way that nations work together. Because I'm not sure that hopping between G20s and G7, COP presidency initiatives, you know, all sort of augmented by a series of sort of bilateral and plurilateral initiatives, 
is really going to get us to that kind of deep collaboration and coordination of energy policy that's going to be required. Thanks, Catherine. And that's uh, on the note of deep collaboration and international initiative and coordination. Um, one more question to the panel here in the room, Glenn. Um, what's your view on what needs to be done and what can we do to get this discussion on the right rails and shape it into the next COP cycle? So thanks, thanks very much, Katarina. The, I, think, I think one model that has been really interesting to watch has been the Energy Transition Council. Uh, and the, the Energy Transition Council uh, began as uh, a COP26 initiative, uh, trying to get this global community together to engage with specific countries in, with developing and emerging economies uh, to encourage them to be more ambitious in their energy transition. The, 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 the value of this council has been it's brought together a very political dialogue with a technical dialogue and a financing dialogue at the same time and encouraged countries to think about what they may want to do and so we go back to this idea of building off of the country's priorities. And once that direction of travel is, is set, then how does the global community respond to those interests? And I'll, I'll, I'll give you two, two examples where I think it's worked really, really well. One is in Morocco, the Energy Transition Council began discussing with Morocco around its energy transition. Uh, and at the beginning, Morocco is not interested in, in discussing coal. Uh, it was essentially off the table. Through this process, Morocco has now become much more engaged and interested in identifying how they can phase out coal from their energy mix uh, with the assistance of uh, other renewables, with the assistance of the global, global community. The second example uh, is also coal related, but it comes through the energy transition mechanism that was launched by the Asian Development Bank. And here we have two countries that are willing to pilot this energy transition mechanism, the Philippines and Indonesia, uh, not insignificant economies at all in Southeast Asia, uh, who are saying, okay, can, can, can you help us transition away from our coal-fired power plants and our coal assets as long as it's affordable to customers, affordable to industry, because industry and the, and the energy needed for growing economies is a must, but also affordable t to the public purse. Uh, and, and so it's, it's these mechanisms that need to be put into place because we're entering this next phase of, okay, the, polit the politics is getting, is getting aligned. What's the next link in the chain? We need mechanisms that can start to bring more credibility to the energy transition movement uh, in many of these countries. Thanks. Thanks to all the uh, panelists, and we're now ready to take questions from the room. Hi, Richard Folland, uh, Carbon Tracker. Great interventions, presentations, a lot of rich material there. Catherine, I was really interested in the point you just made about, in a way, new multilateralism, I think. You know, quite a powerful point that you made about the establishment of the, the new institutions after World War II, the Bretton Woods institutions, the UN, and so on. And I wonder if you'd like to elaborate on, on that you know, the 21st century challenges, climate change, most of all in that context. And, you know, thinking about the existing institutions we have, I mean, we could add the OECD, the IEA themselves to that, of course, but what you think might be required in terms of new international frameworks and institutions which really can take forward these challenges in particular around the energy transition. Thank you. Catherine. Great, thank you. I thought I'd better wait till I was invited. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a good question. I don't um, pretend to have, um, you know, the sort of a well thought through answer on this. 
I, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at, at nuclear um, issues before I came to climate. And if you think about the, the huge range of institutions that there are as part of the nuclear key, where you know, and the IAEA, you know, as a, as a parallel to the IEA, where countries will get together and they will align their regulation on things like nuclear safety, or the nuclear suppliers group, which will have, you know, common agreements on what they will export or not export. And you think, you know, about where that happens, where does that conversation happen, you know, across the energy sector, where governments come together and they actually align their policy approaches or they align their regulation. Um, and I think you see the absence of this in the many initiatives that then get set up by individual nations which, which want to see the alignment of, of governance through many of the sectoral initiatives that you, know, that you can see, whether it's the Energy Transition Council that the UK has led or things like Lead It, which, which Sweden's led. And I guess my contention is that you know, in the long run, the more efficient way to do this would be to create you know, center, real centers of gravity for, for multilateral governance. And I, I think it could be done in, in different ways, but, but places where countries come together deliberately themselves proactively and table um, proposals in order to align other government approaches. If you think about steel and what's necessary to transition the production of steel or shipping or aviation, or any of these globally traded sectors, it's difficult to see how any of them will really get there unless groups of countries actually decide that they're going to align their, their policy approaches and regulation. Thanks, Catherine. Nicholas, yeah. were you going to add to that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and that was a beautiful transition, too, in talking about nuclear. So many of you are already familiar, I suppose, with the idea of actually, in a way, building on the, the experience on the existential threat of nuclear weapons in proposing a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty uh, to really tackle the whole gamut of, of challenges, both in terms of phasing out fossil fuels very, very quickly, at the same time promoting the alternatives, the renewable energy system we're talking about here as a comprehensive framework and really responding in the same kind of way that we did back then when countries were about to get onto the nuclear bandwagon and we actually took a, put a stop, non-proliferation, agreed in, in these kinds of negotiations to phase out and, and, and then also have a peaceful transition. So, that initiative is going to be actually talked about in the session after here. Uh, it's in, if you haven't picked it up, which would be hard if you've been in this space for two weeks, it's having an incredible attraction. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly powerful narrative. There's so many different kinds of actors buying into this. And, and I think we can see some tremendous developments also really on the diplomatic side and getting some real negotiations to happen quite quickly. And of course, what this does is it really puts the focus on the production side. You cannot fuddle around with net zero targets, offsets, new technologies, CCS, etc. It's actually stopping production, but also doing that in an equitable way. And that's absolutely essential. And I think the first presentation was spot on, right? The, the kind of equity framing that is now being developed, recognizing that not all countries are in the same position. You've got to have some kind of principles to actually negotiate the double overproduction uh, that is planned in accordance with one and a half. Uh, degrees so that we do this in a way that is not just, you know, who has the greenest or cheapest uh, oil to continue the longest. It's actually about which countries need to go first, which countries need to support others, who needs to have more time and more support. And then the third pillar of the treaty from non preparation, disarmament, the just transition is exactly what we're talking about here. And of course, going to, as you said, going to individual countries too, you know, this got to be negotiated and put on the agenda as a whole package, but it's also, you know, speaking to countries and saying, look, you're about maybe to jump onto this bandwagon of fossil fuels because it seems to be a cash a revenue possibility. You know, it's for us as international community to say, look, there's other ways and it's gonna be that, you know, uh, very quickly. You don't wanna go that wrong way, but we gotta have to provide the context, the support, the guarantees, the backing to make this alternative renewable energy system and again not just any renewables but a sound people-based environmentally socially sound renewable energy system possible and that's I think what we need to see in terms of new multilateral um, approaches which speaks to what this process also should deliver in terms of 
climate finance, technology sharing, and so on. Of course, this is a complement to the emissions-oriented uh, discussions we're having here. It's not to replace UNFCCC, but it's really getting to the core of it. And we should have really put this at the core back in Rio, production rather than emissions, which is a bit harder. Thanks, uh, thanks, Walia. You're giving me an opportunity now to uh, do a tiny little bit of self-promotion because Carbon Tracker has actually just launched the fossil fuel registry. So this is again, if you're talking about overproduction and assets, um, it allows you to track the assets, but also it goes into the same idea of having the region, where are they actually situated, where is support needed, where is additional fast tracking needed. Um, next question in the room, please. Nick Robbins, Professor of Sustainable Finance at London School of Economics. Uh, very good presentations and fantastic uh, panel. Uh, what's been striking here at COP is some numbers, a statement of intent from the financial sector, 130 trillion committed intent to be net zero, obviously lots of devil in the detail there, a still structural failure to honor the, pro honor the promise of 100 billion in terms of uh, climate finance. And yet a very positive, I think, uh, hopeful package uh, with South Africa to enable 8.5 billion to help that country uh, implement its just transition, phase out uh, coal, uh, scale up renewables, scale up green hydrogen, and so on. And I was just really thinking about the, uh, the sense of technological inevitability we heard from Matt Ives, the sense of sort of a potential uh, of uh, finance there, and how do we really deliver more of these South Africa type deals to deliver uh, the sort of clean energy opportunities in ways that meet developing countries' socioeconomic priorities? Thank you. Glenn, could I call on you for that one as a first start? <laughs> sure, I, 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 think that's, I think that's a great comment. Uh, I, I think that this is exactly the type of, of next steps that help with this credibility issue. Uh, if, if uh, to, to look at it conversely, if there are countries and economies that are ready to make that, to take that next step, and we're not capable of providing the support that's needed, um, then we're, we're really putting ourselves at risk uh, in terms of, of helping these new economies b build out their, their uh, energy transitions. I'd, I'd just like to also reflect you know, the, the importance of recognizing what the tipping point in terms of technologies will be for different types of economies. And how can we rush to that tipping point recognizing that uh, increase of, of utility grade renewables, scale renewables in California will be different than uh, increasing utility scale renewables uh, uh, in Kenya um, or in Pakistan. Uh, so we, we, we really need to embrace those differences rush to that tipping point, let industry take over at a certain point. Uh, that's, that's the challenge. And I think this is actually an interesting point where we should bring Spencer back in, because clearly at some stage you get policymakers, you then get the market to take over, and then you really industry kicks in. And at the moment we have seen relatively limited kicking in by industry, and I would like to understand from Spencer, perhaps you can give us your perspective how, where do you see, how far away do you see things from this tipping point and what, where does industry see, what kind of ingredients and what stages does it need to see that tipping point? Thank you. I guess a, a couple of points. One, picking up on the point that Catherine was m making earlier about the role of development institutions. Despite the, uh, the cost reductions that, that Matt was talking about, um, Wind and solar remains a very capital intensive uh, type of investment. If the cost of capital in different parts of the developing world is three or four times the cost of that in the West, we need to find ways in which we can bring that cost of capital down. Now, if that cost of capital, to a very large extent, that higher reflects um, different types of risk, there's a very significant role for the development institutions of finding ways of mitigating that risk, of finding different ways of putting wrappers around uh, loans to allow that private capital to flow in ways which is not so exposed um, to, the, to that um, risk. Public sector balance sheets of different forms are very good at, at bearing risk. And so I think having an urgency 
to redefine and rethink some of the objectives of the inter international institutions to, to find ways of mobilizing that capital is key. I think the other point I, I would just like to put on the table, I think um, the cost reductions that, that Matt uh, identified are, are clearly hugely encouraging and, and hugely um, exciting. The thing I think I'd like to do is just move, are, are they sufficient to be confident about this or, or, or are they, um, are they necessary but not sufficient? So if we'd start, when um, Len mentioned Prime Minister Modi's comments uh, earlier uh, last week, and one of the objectives he, he mentioned was getting up to 500 gigawatts of wind and solar capacity by 2030. India today starts at 100 gigawatts, roughly, and the most they've ever put on in one year is about 12. So to go from 100 to 500, over the next 10 years is an enormously um, uh, ambitious um, aim. The cost reductions that Matt talked about are, are absolutely essential for that to come about. But my, my guess is they're not, they're not in their own sufficient. And I think what we all need to be doing is thinking what else will need to happen? What other enabling technologies, enabling mechanisms will need to happen to ensure that we can achieve that? Reducing the cost of capital will be one, thinking about how to build out massive distribution networks would be um, another, thinking about how to increase and improve permitting will be another. So thinking beyond those cost reductions are the other things that need to be happening, which will then, which I think will be, will also be necessary ingredients to get this massive rollout of wind and solar that we all want to see. Thanks. Thanks everybody for that. those uh, comprehensive answers. We now take the last question in the room. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Zipporah Berman. I'm the chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. And I, I have a question uh, for, for Mr. Dale. You mentioned that BP is thinking hard about meeting the needs of Global South countries, considering the need in, uh, for, for more energy. I, I assume you're, you're saying that to justify uh, continued expansion in fossil fuel infrastructure and production. And I'm just wondering how you square this with the science that clearly says now that we need to stop the expansion of oil and glass, gas globally if we're going to stay below 1.5 degrees. We know just at 1.1 degrees that millions in the global south have lost their homes and thousands have lost their lives. And, given the science is in, in the Global South's interest to meet energy needs with renewables and electrification. And then secondly, I'm just, uh, my understanding is that BP is currently projecting eight billion in CAPEX on new on oil and gas projects per year between now and 2030. I'm wondering if you can tell us what BP is planning to spend on renewables during that same period. So thank you. So. Um, I, I recognize and agree with the science that you, uh, that, that you describe, which is why that's central to BP's ambitions and BP's purpose. BP um, have a clear ambition to reduce the amount of oil and gas we produce um, by 40% over the next 10 years. So not by 2050 in some wishy-washy thing, but to reduce the amount of oil and gas we produce over the next 10, uh, by 40% over the next 10 years. And at the same time, to increase um, our level of spending on low carbon technologies and tenfold over that period of, of time. Um, will that um, increase, um, will that be the, the same amount as we will spend on oil and gas? I, um, over the cumulative 10 year period, no, we, we, there will still be more investment in oil and gas. And the nature of that thing is because um, many of those projects, you need to invest very large amounts just to stand still. And so I think sometimes comparing a dollar investment in oil and gas is not the same as comparing a, a dollar investment in renewables in terms of the amount of energy produced. But I think by towards by 2030, I think those two numbers will be fun, coming far closer together. And as I say, 40% reduction in the oil and gas we produce and a tenfold increase in our investment in, 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 uh, in low carbon technology. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thanks to the presenters. So if we uh, bring this all together, um, we've got a tremendous amount of risk that we're seeing in the most exposed petrostates, uh, with about 400 million people exposed, um, with some of the countries looking forward 
to 40% reduction in fiscal revenues if they don't get it right. Conversely, we have mass we have seen the massive potential for cost reductions. And to put that all together, we seem to have gone on to some conclusions that are saying we need international cooperation, we need to step up that deep collaboration, we need to step, step up our thoughts on how we can actually support the Global South and how countries, I would think the most important thing is we need to empower countries to find their own way, to find their own tipping point. Um, there is no, there's no use in prescribing or in pushing. The, it needs to come from the bottom up of those countries and they actually need to be empowered to get to the tipping point and take advantage of that, of that opportunity. So thank you very much and I will now hand over to Mark Campanali, who is our, the founder of Carbon Tracker, to some final remarks. Oh, great, this mic's working. So, um, great turnout for today. I, I particularly want to thank Federated Hermes yet again for allowing us to use this fabulous event space and being completely I mean, committed to uh, what we're trying to achieve. And we've worked with Federated Hermes now for a, a number of years. Um, and w what a great set of presentations and speeches. And uh, I, my... my, my uh, eyes were caught by this solar descending from heaven um, that we saw in the charts, just showing how fast this clean energy revolution has been. Because what this presentation has been about, uh, absolutely, is the rapid technology change that we're seeing and the idea that we could deliver the Paris goals uh, within the time frame because of the speed of the energy trans um, transition or revolution is actually really exciting. And all the fossil fuels that we hear planned under development not being needed, that's one of the clear messages away from the COP. So that's, for me, the takeaway. I particularly also want to thank Katerina for doing a terrific job uh, as our head of research uh, monitoring uh, this panel and these fabulous exchanges. Everyone ready for a drink? I think there's going to be some booze soon, which will roll on through the evening, hopefully. Um, and. Um, uh, we'll, yeah, it starts at five o'clock, so we've got a little bit of time before it starts. And I do hope you stow on, stay on and continue this conversation and, and pick up on the research. And hopefully some of the panelists will be able to stay on with us so we can chat again afterwards. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.